Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly live program. And before we begin, I want to remind you that you are a very important part of this program. During the second half, we will be asking you to call us or email us for questions for tonight's guest. You're a very important part of the show. That's why this is a live program. I'm going to read a section of scripture for you this evening. It comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. And passing along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. It says that Simon, when he heard this call of Jesus, immediately left his nets. And I believe that's true. But I believe also that in this moment, Simon had the kind of experience that uh, I've had, and I guess you've probably had, which we might call an eternal moment. Standing before him is Jesus. And Jesus puts to him this challenge. Drop everything and follow me. And for what seemed like an eternity to Simon, that old phrase, his whole life flashed before his, his eyes, he probably thought, okay, what's this going to mean? What's going to happen with my fishing fleet? All the men working for me. What's this decision going to do to my family, to my wife, my children, to uh, my friends, my co-workers? How am I going to eat tomorrow? How am I going to support myself? Where am I going to live? What about my future? And like all of us, we have all kinds of voices that come in trying to convince us one way or other on these decisions that we're challenged to make. And we can imagine that voice coming in, well, Tell him you'll let him know tomorrow, or maybe a week, or maybe a month. And as Peter is thinking this through, there in front of him is Jesus, eyeball to eyeball. Follow me now. We know from Scripture that he did immediately. Our guest for this evening, Stephen Wood, had such an eternal moment. One time, standing before his own congregation as a pastor, recognizing that he was forced to make a decision that would, in fact, change his entire life, affect his career, affect his family, affect whether he would have any kind of ministry for the rest of his life. And he was faced with this very difficult decision, which was an eternal moment. But as a result of that decision, not only did his wife Karen and his five children at that point, well, eventually come into the Catholic Church, but it has shaped his entire life now to where he is now the founder and president of Family Life International, which is the end result of this decision, which we'll talk about in a moment. But also it led him to found and lead an organization called St. Joseph Covenant Keepers. Steve, it is a great privilege for us to gather. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, it's this, an honor to be on your show. Well, this is crazy, isn't it? I mean, I end up saying this every week to our convert guests, how wild it is that here you and I are, of all things, on Catholic television. <laughs> you know, if uh, 12 years ago somebody approached me and said, uh, you know, as uh, alumni from the same seminary, That's right. that uh, we'd be on uh, Mother Angelica's Catholic Network talking about our conversions to the Catholic Church, I would have put the probability uh, for that around the same category as being abducted by a UFO. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't have the remotest idea something like this would be taking and, place. And you mentioned the fact that we're from the same seminary. I mean, it, and there's a number of us that have all come from this same place. God is doing something. In fact, many, our own seminary, for many, Catholics are starting to hear more and more about this seminary. I, know, I think more Catholics know about uh, Gordon Conwell's <laughs> seminary now than Protestants do, perhaps. In fact, you have a little story to tell about that. Well, it was very interesting with kind of fear and trepidation as I approached my diocese to enter the church, my bishop uh, appointed a very nice priest to meet with my family. But the first meeting, I was scared to take my whole family in case I wanted to get out quick. <laughs> and I went in and made small talk with the priest, and he said, but where'd you do your theological training? I said, oh, a place you never heard of, heard of north of Boston, Gordon Conwell Seminary. And he looked at me and smiled, and he said, I taught there. And I thought, uh oh, wait a second. And then it started coming back that our campus had been owned by a Carmelite order. And he proceeded to tell me of, of the prayers that they had prayed for vocation for the young men in that boys' school, and they weren't forthcoming. And so, with great frustration, they put the campus up for sale. And then here comes a 
Protestant Evangelical Seminary to purchase the Catholic campus. And uh, I am convinced that God, with a uh, great sense of humor, simply took those Carmelite prayers and transferred them into these Protestant ministers who are now coming into the church. Because as you know from Gordon Conwell, these conversions are now spreading to other Protestant evangelical seminaries across the country. I know it's a, it is an amazing phenomenon, and it's truly of the Lord. Um, and I think maybe one of the reasons for our particular seminary was because our commitment to Scripture and truth and hearing history and theology, all that was important, and brought us on this journey. But you know, we can't talk about our seminary tonight, given our time. And, and even as we talked earlier, that you know, trying to describe your whole journey is very difficult in the, the short stand, span that we have. Later on in the uh, program, the audience will be able to uh, call in uh, to your 800 number to get a tape on your whole journey if they want to hear the whole story. But we want to focus on tonight uh, this particular moment. Now, your journey uh, came through the rough years of the 60s and right. the wildness of the 60s, and you were even caught up in um, uh, New Age stuff. I mean, before out, it was the New Age movie. You were out there in as, <laughs> as much as That's left right. field. You were in left field before we called it left field. I mean, you were in that. But mm -hmm. through your experience in the Navy, someone encouraging to read the scriptures, you read the scriptures, amazing how the Lord opened it. But eventually, from way out there, it brought you through all of that, uh, through seminary, into the pastorate. And, you know, we don't have a, uh, time to go through the whole thing, but you want to make a comment about that first aspect of your journey, just to bring us up to that eternal moment we want to talk about. Well, I, I developed a love for Scripture, uh, surprisingly, while trying to free myself from my karma. Uh, <laughs> I believed in reincarnation, and I was trying to move to higher states of consciousness, so I bought a Bible and began reading it and asked God if, uh, if there was anything to it that he would speak to me, and mm -hmm. he did very directly, not mm -hmm. through an audible voice, but through scripture, spoke. Mm -hmm. Had a very dramatic conversion experience, didn't know quite what to do with it, mm -hmm. um, but it took me 21 years of my life <laughs> to really find a Christ and a personal relationship with Christ. I almost made it into the Catholic Church <laughs> at that point. Uh, I was getting out of the service. I was all excited about meeting Jesus, and I got a roll of quarters. I went to a payphone, and uh, I was a little discouraged with the church situation I had found. And one of my friends told me there was this guy who was really, really serious about following Christ. His name was St. Francis, and he still had some followers around in these Franciscan monasteries. So I went to a uh, payphone with a roll of quarters and started calling around until I got a Franciscan monastery on the phone. <laughs> and I said, hi, I'm Steve Wood. I've just decided to follow Jesus. I'm getting out of the Navy in a few weeks. I'd like to come join your monastery. <laughs> and there was silence on the other end of the phone. And, and the man said, well, you, you uh, have to be a Catholic before you come here. I said, fine, what's next? And he said, well, you have to be a Catholic one year. And I couldn't wait a year for anything, so it took me 21 more years to uh, find my way into the church. Um, instead of the Franciscan Monastery, it was out to California. I attended the uh, a church, Calvary Chapel, well one of the mother church, uh, yeah. churches of the Jesus Movement. I was involved in children's and youth ministry out there. Attended the Sem Assembly of God uh, College, finished my college, uh, great wealth, learning how to read the New Testament, the original languages mm -hmm. and such. And from there, came back to Florida, youth ministry, campus ministry, prison ministry, evangelistic ministries. Uh, met my covenant partner, Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, we proceeded then to Gordon Conwell. And after graduation, came back and planted a new little congregation. And that and kind of brought me up to the doors of... Uh, and there you are. Mm-hmm. A pastor of this congregation, and your convictions are like most of us evangelicals were. Uh, scripture is the sole foundation. Uh, right. Yet you were within this Presbyterian Calvinistic perspective on interpreting Scripture, um, and was very, as a Calvinistic, we had a very almost narrow way of interpreting Scripture, but usually very literally. But you, but you know, just like in my own life, the Lord used a great number of two by fours to get your attention, which eventually brought you on this journey home. But for tonight, we want to focus on this one particular moment, which we call that eternal moment, which changed your life in a direction you never would have believed. <laughs> yes, there was one Sunday. I don't know if my congregation got anything out of it, but my sermon <laughs> literally changed my life. I'd been preaching through the Old Testament, taking a Sunday in each book of the Bible. And I got to the minor prophets, Hosea, mm -hmm. and also I was studying Malachi. 
And the whole theme of these books was people had broken, the people of God had broken covenant with God, and as a result were breaking their marriage covenants. And these two covenants, the marriage covenant and divine covenant going back and forth. And several years there had been a prick in my conscience that uh, kind of the easy approval for, for Christians, a divorce and remarriage, divorce and remarriage, that uh, I had been taught that it's sometimes okay in certain limited circumstances, but yet in just a decade of the pastorate, I'd seen my own denomination mm. almost throw out any standards. It entirely, mm. one or two exceptions had grown into a thousand exceptions, and the exceptions became the norm. So there I stood before my congregation. It was right after I had preached this sermon that God took these marriage vows very seriously, that uh, as Christians we take a vow to pledge our faithfulness to our spouses for all our life, and Jesus clearly affirms that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and St. Paul does as well in the New Testament. And I thought my problem was going to be with my sermon, and it wasn't. I thought, pressure's off. I sat down for the offertory, which were the five of the most intense moments of my life, I would dare say, because we were about ready to approach the Lord's Supper, yeah. which in Presbyterian circles we call that, that sacrament, and um, God just spoke to me very clearly, yeah. you're not going to do this hmm. anymore, hmm. in that there had been those in my congregation as Christians uh, improperly divorced and remarried again, mm -hmm. some with my approval, uh, others who in fact who had even left the Catholic Church, mad at mm -hmm. the church's position on lifelong Christian marriage that I had welcomed into my congregation. And it was a surprise to me, it wasn't during the sermons where I thought I would have problems of conscience, but it was that covenant, you see, is where God and His people become one yeah. in the Eucharist, well, well, the Lord's Supper in right. Protestant terms, but that's the sacrament of oneness there which between you, God and His people. Which points out at this point that you had already developed quite a high view of that particular sacrament. Right. I had been doing something extremely dangerous for any minister to do. And I would start reading the Church Fathers. And, you know, you don't have to get any further in St. Ignatius. Yeah. And, and the more you're into the early fathers, the more your appreciation yeah. of, uh, for instance, John chapter 6 grows and yeah. grows and grows. And so I saw that that was the melting point. So I was sitting there thinking, I mean, I had even preached sermons where if you're making a major decision affecting your life, first thing you do is you take time. So I thought, well, Lord, I just need to take time about this. And he says, no, no. we're going to do this now. <laughs> or I had a very keen sense that that was my opportunity or Christ was just going to pass me by. And then I started thinking, and I wish I didn't have to, but the very practical things. I mean, uh, I have a wife, five children to support. I mean, if I follow through with these convictions as a Protestant minister, I don't know of a Protestant church that would have me. So there goes my career. There goes my calling. Um, and so, yeah. I don't know. God just gave me the grace, and I uh, went up, stood by the communion table, and I said, I'm just not prepared uh, at this point to exercise the Lord's Supper today. Because that is such a critical moment because of what that supper even meant for us as Protestants, mm -hmm. even though we may have seen it as, as a symbol, it still was a symbol of Christ being with us, sacrificing himself for us, our sign of receiving Christ. It was our Presbyterian altar call, if you want to put it that way. Uh, you know, sign were, of the covenant. It was a sign of the covenant. And by you recognizing that moment that if you gave that to them, you were confirming all those decisions in their lives, which you realize as a pastor, I can't confirm right. any longer. It, it would have been a sign of contradiction versus our right. oneness in marriage is supposed to be in harmony with our oneness in Christ. Well, I just told my congregation that I couldn't do it. I didn't say why. And I um, pronounced a benediction and I walked out. My elders <laughs> right after me, uh, I told them my convictions that. Um, uh, that I ba basically believed that marriage was lifelong and I just couldn't in conscience as a minister be administering the Lord's Supper in such a context where, where these things were out of sync. And I realized it wasn't my job to unravel my congregation because I had agreed to their ways of doing things when I became a minister there. So we mutually recognized that my life in that congregation was over. I also had a talk with Karen that afternoon because I realized also my career was over and I had spent my whole adult life preparing to be a minister, uh, studying to be a minister or being a minister, and I had no other career parachutes and I recognized that this was going to be a very costly decision and I'm um, very thankful that God 
gave me a covenant partner that said, follow the truth. You know, uh, this is a little bit off track just for a second, but I'm uh, thinking about, this is one of the reasons why I believe so strongly in the celibacy of the clergy, because w one of the values of the celibacy of the clergy, it allows them the freedom to risk being faithful, to, to proclaim to the congregation what is true. Because what do they have to risk in their own wife and children? It's the, if they lose their job, they lose their job. Your decision to take a stand on what was true, in fact, did that very thing. It cost you your job, it cost you your future. At that point, you weren't really thinking the Catholic Church per se, but it, that decision affected more than just you. Oh, it absolutely. Was your wife, it very your children, and eventually your effect with your family. Now, but, but how did that get you to look at the Catholic Church? Well, you know, we had this seminary classmate, what was his name? Scott somebody or another, uh, Han, I think his last name was. Well, I had heard this, uh, you know, that Han had become a Catholic, and I thought, that's not the one that I know, because I mean, the one I know was pretty anti-Catholic in seminary. I mean, I had prejudices against Catholicism, but his were quite ripe, you his know. Defined and, prejudices. Right, but uh, I basically, uh, had been studying the fathers, and I knew that I was headed to a more historic form of the church. Catholicism was my last option, but when it came to my convictions about marriage, my list of options for historical forms of the church yeah. came down to one. That's this so is sad. the only church left in the world. Well, I think it's also a point of truth, because the true bride of Christ, the church is the bride of Christ, mm -hmm. and where the fullness of the faith is, you'll find marriage preserved, mm -hmm. and every single Christian church denomination is broken off from the Catholic Church sooner or later starts legitimizing uh, yeah. divorce, remarriage amongst Christians and that type of thing. It reminds us of that passage in Romans where it says, where Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And the reality is these other groups that kind of cast themselves away from the authority start conforming right. to the pressures, the voices of the world that are pressuring us not to make difficult stand standards for our congregations. Right. And, well, you recognize that the church had hung true. Right. Now, during that time, uh, my time of crisis, in, in a certain sense, I felt extremely lonely mm -hmm. because here I had given my life to the church and now I was sort of a man without one. Mm -hmm. And uh, my convictions made me feel very lonely, except for my immediate family. I basically had zero support. At this point, your wife was very supportive. Though. Extremely, yeah. and, uh, but I didn't Praise have any God, other. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. Karen was very instrumental at that point, encouraged me to go on. But uh, you know, I had purchased uh, some time before a copy of Vatican II documents and the post-Vatican II documents. Which and is just to be dangerous. ecumenical, I had them up on my <laughs> shelf. I never read them, like most people. But it was this right here that really swung me, mm -hmm. changed me, wanted to be a Catholic. I read The Role of the Christian Family in the Modern World by Pope John Paul II. And what I found in this encyclical was so good because I basically started my pastorate in youth ministry. Mm -hmm. And I found that the key to youth ministry wasn't the youth minister, it was mom and dad. So I decided I wanted to be the kind of pastor that would help moms and dads be successful in their marriages and their families so that youth pastors like myself wouldn't have to perform miracles. Mm -hmm. So for 20 years, I had been on the lookout for something solid to help families. And everything I was looking for in two decades was in this one document by Pope John Paul II, and it was so good that I decided after reading this, and by the way, I can't believe that Catholics don't read. Well, is this something a lay person can read and enjoy? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and if they don't, we even you know, provide some materials to help people through yeah. these things. But um, what I did then is I called Scott, I called, contacted Catholic Answers, and I said, send the info, because the Catholic <laughs> Church has it right on marriage and family life, critically so. So I, in a certain sense, backed into the Catholic Church. Because of my convictions on marriage, I was forced to study the rest of the Catholic mm -hmm. faith, which I just didn't even give it a passing thought. And as we talked over at dinner, yeah. most Protestant ministers, most, even well-educated ones, have not read mm -hmm. a single book written by a Catholic about Catholicism. Mm -hmm. And that was my case. So I started reading the books, and the more I read, tw yeah. you know, it just it fit together quite well. You make a, a, a really strong uh, challenge there to the lay Catholics that are watching us to know their faith and to read 
what the oh, church teaches. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, basically, I've dedicated uh, right. my life to not only, in fact, I found some other good things that are out there. This first one, the role of the Christian family in the modern world, Latin title, Familiaris Consortio. I like mm -hmm. English titles because most people are like me and prefer English. But the role of the Christian family in the modern world. And then, I'm not aware of this ever happening in the history of the church, a pope writing a letter to the families, the families. of the world. Yeah. And uh, a wonderful document, again, by Pope John Paul II. Uh, this is the one of human life, humani vitae. Now this little one, this is one everybody likes to dissent from, but I wish they'd just spend 15 minutes and read, read it, it before it. they dissent, because there's so much truth yeah. in here. Uh, quite frankly, there's enough truth in here to transform a marriage that's mm -hmm. having serious trouble right here. And then this one, Pope Pius XI's on Christian marriage, which was basically the rock's answer to Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned mm -hmm. Parenthood in the first mm -hmm. part of this century. And then Pope Leo XIII's Arcanum in the late uh, 19th century. These things are so good. And I have, you know, there's wonderful things that Protestant evangelicals do in marriage and family yeah, life. Yeah. There truly are. Mm -hmm. and, but if you take all of that, and that's what I've tried to do, I don't reject my evangelical background. I've just found a fuller expression of that in the Catholic Church. But um, this is like, um, I hope James Dobson doesn't mind my using his name, but this is like putting jet boosters behind James yeah. Dobson because this is, this is the fullness of the faith and uh, I believe Satan knows where to attack yeah. and the family and marriages yeah. are under oh, attack this and century. this is how the rock can provide that solid foundation for marriage life. So pardon me for getting a little excited no. about this. Well, but uh, I want to be sure and mention to the audience that uh, even as we're speaking here that your new book has just come out called Christian Fatherhood in which you in fact take the teachings exactly. from these documents and make them very applicable with a particular challenge to fathers. You're not supposed to give my resources away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's just these things, and it kind of mystifies me a little bit. We've had these truths here for this whole century. Never before have we seen in Western history such breakup of marriages and family life, and we have the answer in the Catholic faith. So. Yes, this needs to get out. Not just to Catholic families, by the way. Protestants care just as much, and people who are people without the Christian faith. Family means a lot, and the Catholic Church has the answers. It was because the Catholic Church stood firm on its teaching of marriage that brought you in. Absolutely. And what that is a challenge to us as Catholics to recognize that our witness individual or as a group standing firm on this is a witness to our neighbors and others who are struggling with marriage is that we, it's a witness that they can come home to the Catholic Church right. to discover the teaching and maybe uh, there's so much we could talk about but probably should ask you very briefly to for our audience describe uh, succinctly what does the Catholic Church teach on the issue of marriage divorce remarriage I mean there's so much the, the, the catechism right the, well marriage is a sacrament it's a sacred covenant oath. It's not a contract with a 50-50. If it doesn't work out, you know, we split here. But it's, it's lifelong, and according to Jesus, there is no reason that it separates until death. Mm -hmm. Now, the Catholic Church has the highest standards for marriage in the world. That's tough to live by. Mm -hmm. But as I say in the new book, not only does it have the highest standards in the world, but it has the best delivery system, <laughs> just a little PS on how these sacraments interface. The Blessed Eucharist is designed by God to give us gallons upon gallons of graces. Think of the new wine that Christ made at Cana. Okay, New wine, if you look a little further, in John's Gospel he starts talking about abiding in me. In John 15, that's when Christ was in the upper room instituting the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. The Eucharist provides the graces that we need to have the charity in our hearts that we lack in and of ourselves. And so, by Christ's design, we not only have the sacrament of marriage, but we have sacrament of the Eucharist, the Blessed Eucharist, have the sacrament of reconciliation. Because if you have guilt, guilt drives people crazy. It drives relationships haywire. So you have to deal with guilt, and you have to have a source of grace. And so, yes, the Catholic Church has the highest standard, but if you follow the fullness of the Catholic teaching, you'll find the grace you need to live in a happy sacramental marriage. And very often when, when folk look at scripture for a description of marriage, sometimes people draw us only to Ephesians. And that, you know, almost 
a misinterpretation mm -hmm. of that that poses the wife against the husband, the submission. Right. And, the, and when we look at really what Scripture is calling us there, this issue of mutual submission, mutual love, but a balanced aspect, a different role for the husband and the father. For many of these are difficult words, but as you said, it is the grace that the church gives us through the sacraments that enables us to be the father and the husband we're supposed to be. We can't be that on our own. I mean, I, I make a testimony of my own failings as husband and father that we need God's grace to do that. And the only way that marriage can ever begin and remain is to recognize this indissoluble link that is there in the sacrament. Not this, well, we'll give it a try, and if it doesn't work, we can always get out. Right. If you begin with that thought, you never begin. Right. There's too much of a reservation. In order to really give oneself in marriage, there has to be the confidence that once you give yourself, your heart's not going to be stepped on. Your heart's not going to be rejected. That somebody's not going to turn around and leave after a dozen years. But that if you truly are going to give yourself, you need to have that quiet confidence that as you pledge your love lifelong to your spouse and your spouse does to you, that that's going to stick. And without that confidence, you really even don't even have the vows which uh, form the foundation of a marriage covenant. When we come back in a little bit, we'll listen to the phone calls. But before then, I want to ask you the question, how did this decision have an impact on your family, your colleagues, your career? <laughs> <laughs> you just moved on oh, the next day like nothing happened. Uh, right? No, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's quite a shock, quite frankly. I mean, obviously, economically, it was a shock. Um, I had no idea uh, what was going to happen to the rest of my life. I thought it was going to be a very predictable <laughs> life as a uh, Protestant evangelical minister. Um, the uh, The Catholic Church is very different from the Protestant <laughs> Church, the adjustments. Uh, little did I imagine a lot of this would, uh, you know, the, uh, the ministry would continue. Uh, yeah. The little did I recognize that everything, you know, our family struggles, it was a little tough uh, in the beginning, but God was very faithful in providing for us, actually very uh, yeah. remarkable ways. So, you know, there may be some Protestant ministers listening tonight thinking, oh man, I just couldn't go through that. I mean, in a certain sense, I thought, <laughs> what did I do to myself? What did I do to my family? But God's good. You know, that is a good message, and especially for any Protestant ministers that might be watching who might be interested in, in the ministry that I do in Coming Home Network. It's, that's one of the most common questions. Yeah. What am I going to do? Right. And even as we look at our lives, we had no idea of knowing back then that we'd be doing what we're doing now. God is as faithful on this side as he ever was on the other side, right? More so. Oh, he, yeah. It's, uh, but you have to lay it down. You have to be willing to go through kind of a, a death resurrection experience, and uh, it definitely is involved in, in coming in. But, you know, just on the practical side, a little something. Uh, when we came in, my parish and just might put an idea in somebody's mind, how can you help yeah. minister? minister families coming in. Well, my parish provided a, an empty convent uh, for my family. <laughs> I mean, being on your show, little did I ever expect to be living in a convent. <laughs> but after we moved in, uh, we found out the name of the convent was Mary, Queen of the Woods. And I knew somebody had been looking out for us. And so really for four years, first four years as Catholics, we lived in the convent and gave me the economic freedom to uh, start the Family Life Center. God's been good to you. He a very unsuspected journey, uh, but he is very good to us and continues to all provide every one of us an opportunity to serve him if we just surrender to him. We'll be back in just a moment to receive your calls and emails as we talk with Stephen Wood about his journey home. Welcome back. Our guest this evening is Stephen Wood, and we've been talking about how the Lord has brought him on a journey as a result of an eternal moment as he stood before his congregation, was conf confronted with a very difficult issue, and that issue 
was this issue of the indissolubility of marriage. We've been talking about how he viewed that before and how he was uh, challenged in his own study of Scripture, but then was drawn to see the strength of the Catholic Church and its consistent stand on the sacrament of marriage. Uh, we're going to go right to the calls this evening. And uh, Steve, you ready for calls? Let's go. All right. Hello. We have a first call. Where are you from? I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Well, welcome, Cleveland. Thank you. Steve, I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned that um, a big part of your um, leaving your own denomination was the indissolubility of marriage in the Catholic Church, how do you look at the issue of annulments? I hear a lot of Protestants say annulments are nothing more than Catholic divorce, and in fact there's been a great increase in annulments. People with children that have been married for years uh, are are divorced and remarried having utilized the instrument of annulment. And I just wonder how you look at that and how you would explain that to your uh, former Protestant peers. Very good question and a very common question. And a complex question. <laughs> <laughs> this is a whole show, but let me touch a couple of, of things I think are very relevant towards your question. Uh, first of all, the Catholic Church has always held its standards on indissolubility. Uh, the, all branches of Christendom have struggled with mm -hmm. failed yeah. marriages. Yeah. It's a question of, in the process of that struggle, do you lower or do you maintain your standard? And I think it's very well known all the way around that the Catholic Church has held its standard. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, as the crisis in marriages has arisen in the modern world, John Paul II has been outspoken mm -hmm. in holding up that standard repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Now, an annulment is not a divorce. An annulment is a declaration of nullity that a, a sacramental Christian marriage had not taken place. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a situation here in this country where there's a, a, just a mm -hmm. rising yeah. number of annulments. And generally, people towards me want to kind of throw uh, the problem towards the problems in the marriage tribunals or the problems in annulments. I think if we backed up a little bit, to me, if you want any idea, or I think the, the, the answer is in helping marriages that exist uh, with the fullness yeah. of these encyclicals right now to get, and then even more important than that is getting to young people with the fullness of mm. the Catholic faith contained in these encyclicals. And what the new catechism says, instruct them in honorable courtship. And there's a book I like to write right there on honorable courtship and taking these these truths to young people because really the by the time the marriages have broken up and the marriage tribunals receive these things it's not their fault it's it's been a problem long in advance and we've got critical problems in our culture. Yeah, I was going to say in fact part of the problem today is that in our culture we've made getting married so easy. So I mean easy. Uh, every city has its own little chapel it's only there for people to get married. They can have this, this nice looking little wedding ceremony and there's someone there, maybe right. even a, a self-proclaimed pastor. And getting married is so easy that that's why I said, well, you know, that's why people don't understand right. the issue of the Catholic Church is it, that getting married is very, very serious. We need to prepare our young people so they understand what those vows mean. Right. So death do us part. Can I say something yeah. uh, <laughs> just, just really on my heart right now? You know, the basic problem in this country is that people aren't listening to the Holy Father. Hmm. They think he doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to an issue like Humanae Vitae. Yeah. But this is probably the number one reason for the large numbers of breakup of Catholic marriages. So I would say to somebody, the reason for Catholic marriages failing in this country is because Catholics aren't listening to the Holy Father. 87% yeah, yeah. of Catholics in this nation, married couples of childbearing age, think they're very free to kind of be cafeteria Catholics, come and pick and choose, and this stuff like birth control, I said it there, okay, it's out on the table, that the Pope doesn't know what he's saying on that, and yet those practicing birth control run a 50% probability of divorce. Those following the teaching of Humanae Vitae have less than a 5% probability yeah. of divorce. Yeah. I've been studying marriage for over two and a half decades, and there is nothing that makes such a statistical lowering of your probability of divorce. I would say the number one reason is rejecting Humanae mm. Vitae, rejecting Familiaris Consortio from John Paul II. And if you just heeded those, 
went to confession, regularly received the graces from Christ in the Eucharist, thousands upon thousands of divorces would not be happening right now. Yeah, yeah. And if you're willing to say, I'm I get sorry. excited about yeah, I this. I, you know, okay. oh, I know. Well, we got more questions. We got more questions. We have right. an email message. Hi, Marcus and Steve. Uh, Mark, as you know, we joined the Catholic Church from the Methodist ministry in 1993. These, these are from Jeanine and Chris LaRose. These are friends right. of mine in the Coming Home Network. But what I still can't answer is why us? Why not others in Protestant ministry? Is this another mystery in Christ Jesus, Janine and Chris? Well, I can remember a week in January after I left my pastor, I spent a week <laughs> in prayer and I said, why, why me? me? <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> you've also done But what a privilege. Yeah. I mean, Marcus, I've sat in the confessionals left behind at Gordon Conwell by the Carmelites. Yeah. Where well, they now mm -hmm. store chairs. Well, but I mocked <laughs> that sacrament, yeah. which I now yeah. treasure. Um, yeah. Why? The grace of God. But uh, I will say with very deep conviction, I don't believe we're alone. I believe we're just early. I believe that God has a special work in this generation. I believe in turning into this new millennium that uh, mm -hmm. I sense just what you're doing on this show, on this network, and through the Coming Home Network, mm -hmm. that we are going to see an army of wonderful, zealous, yeah. red-hot, evangelical Christians coming into the fullness of the faith. The Catholic Church is going to give them the fullness of the faith and make them that much more dynamic than they are. And at the same time, that fervor of the evangelicals is going to be a very contagious uh, benefit to the Catholic Church. And so I, I see there's a lot going on here. And uh, this is a work of God's grace because, believe me, it wasn't in my career plans at all yeah, to it, become a Catholic. It wasn't. And I think as we've discussed that, <clears throat> uh, and maybe this is a message to our Catholics who have friends who are outside the church, is that I would say that two of the main reasons that many people do not become Catholic don't think about it in their career is the issues of, of let's say, ignorance. And, I, and we mean that in a sense, they don't have the data about the Catholic Church. As you said, right. so few have ever read a book written by a Catholic. They don't know what the church really teaches. And the second is the area of prejudice, because very often we're taught things about the church that aren't true. And so those outside the church need to know what it truly teaches. And we, laity, we've got to show it to them in our lives and what we teach our children we've got to live it in our lives. And in terms of the prejudices, we've also got to understand that, that people, what did Jesus say from the cross? Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. We, we've got to love them. And why is it that some pastors aren't coming in? Well, they don't have all the data yet. 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 All right. <laughs> yeah, the word's going to get out. Yeah. yeah. All right, we have another email. Dear Steve, what role did Mary play in your conversion? Great show, we love you all. Joseph Rayleigh. Well, of course, I'm still trying to figure that out because <laughs> as a Christian, yeah. I had a mother as a Protestant. Mary was my mother yeah. as a Protestant because Christ gave her to me and to all believers in him at the cross, but I didn't recognize it. I've mentioned one, uh, living in a convent by the name of Mary yeah. Queen of the Woods. Yeah. I've just experienced great blessing. The first time I had the opportunity of speaking on behalf of the Blessed Mother, I receive such spiritual blessings. Um, but that's often a slow one for us converts in those oh, two areas of ignorance yes. and prejudice. It takes a while to work right. through those. Well, in fact, I remember calling Scott Hahn looking for a little sympathy. Of course, that's the wrong guy to call, <laughs> but you know, I said, Scott, it is so hard to work through these doctrines of the Blessed Mother. And I can't do my imitation Hahn, but he goes, yeah, but he said, the hardest is the best, you know, or something <laughs> like right. that. That's right. and, and that's exactly right. And I would yeah. just go a little step further, just where I am in my pilgrimage, is that uh, I think the answer for the family, this might sound simplistic, it's not, is the holy family, mm -hmm. the entire holy family. You know, as a Protestant, I had Jesus alone, and, mm -hmm. and certainly that makes a universe of difference in yeah. one's life. But then to come in and find that Jesus has a mother, and that she, not only in Genesis 3.15, but right through Scripture, is prophesied to play a key role in her son's life. But also, I found out, Mary has a spouse by the name of St. Joseph. And the entire Holy Family is, quite frankly, is, that's the direction that I'm on, is, is, is in my own life, my own family, and other families, bring the entire Holy Family to the needs and concerns of families today. Meditating on the roles mm -hmm. that, they, that, that they give us to follow. We have another caller. Good evening. Uh, what's your name and where are you from? Uh, Margaret Cook from Cuba, New York. Welcome. 
What's your question? Uh, yeah, I'm calling in regard to the four books that you had up there. Um, I believe it was the Humani Vitae uh, for Troubled Marriages. And I would just was wondering who the author of that book is and how I would obtain it. Certainly. Uh, of Human Life, Humani Vitae, it's by Pope Paul VI. And you can get this from the Daughters of St. Paul, almost any Catholic bookstore. I'm sure if you contacted uh, EWTN EB10 or Marcus, some of uh, them, yeah. or you're welcome to contact Family Life Center, we'll be glad to uh, get these to you. And I might uh, also interject that there's a wonderful organization called the Couple to Couple League mm -hmm. in Cincinnati, and uh, th these folks help couples implement the teaching of Humanae Vitae. So along with the encyclical, I would really recommend getting in touch with the Couple to Couple League in order to find the practical ways to implement this in a, in a marriage. And they have couples, teaching couples, how to uh, implement these truths within a marriage. You know, I'm thinking, one of the disappointments that I found, and I don't want to dwell on disappointments that we find when we come into the church, and with so many blessings, but sometimes parish libraries uh, can leave a little much to be desired, sadly enough, and we would love to encourage the laity to get these books Absolutely. for their parish yes. library so that couples in the church can always turn to them, maybe have a study, mm -hmm. gathering people to pick Humana Vitae and read and talk about it, and of mm -hmm. course invite a spiritual director to guide them. Uh, we've got another email. Okay. Mr. Wood, you said earlier in the show that you thought that Christ might pass you by. Use that phrase. How is this possible with you being a baptized Christian? I think getting behind the question, he was saying, did he think Christ would leave me for eternity or something? That's not what my reference was. But it's this, that there are certain times in Christian discipleship that Christ calls you to obedience and you have an opportunity to respond or an opportunity to reject that call. And there's always blessings attached to obedience, always blessings. And for me, uh, I could still be a Protestant minister uh, and miss out on the Blessed Eucharist, miss out in Sacrament Reconciliation, <laughs> miss out in these encyclicals, yeah. miss out in Marcus's show, uh, whatever it would be. I mean, there's a, and, but it's, it's very sobering to think that there are times, and you know, for a Protestant minister, it's also very difficult because this is a calling and, yeah. and recognizing wow. you have no apostolic succession behind your ordination, that you're putting that down. Uh, you know, I baptized my own children and, and used to preaching and ministering sacraments. Uh, these are tough things to walk away from. And, and yet, um, if Christ calls, yeah. uh, we can be patient, Christ is patient, but there comes a time when he says, follow me. Just like he said to St. Peter, you know, leave your nets. And if Peter yeah. didn't leave his nets, what would have he, you know, yeah. had uh, missed out on. And, and that, that writer uh, in the email also brings up another issue, which was behind that, and is, well, many people have different views on what baptism means anyway. Right. To some, baptism is merely a visible sign of an adult acceptance of Jesus. It has no, you know, ultimate sacramental quality. Um, it, but for you, you took that baptismal calling your own life very seriously, as, um, as a part of your own, what we used to call the born again experience. Yes. I mean, it was the beginning of walking with Christ. So there's a sense in which you knew Christ would never leave you like the father of the prodigal son, but we can turn away from our baptism. Right. And that's an important part. You know, we come from uh, our evangelicalism, which, which kind of believes you accept Jesus and you're there guaranteed forever. But the reality is, no, we can turn away. That wasn't what you were talking about sure. in your experience, but we can turn away. And, but let me turn the, the other table to, the, yeah. you know, a lot of times when Christ calls you to obedience, it's scary, it'll involve uh, sacrifice, but there's, you know, Jesus said, you leave me and houses and whatever else yeah. in this age, you'll receive a hundredfold in this age and the age to come eternal life. And uh, everything comes back, except are you just willing to walk away from it for a while? I remember you knowing the calling that Christ was, was drawing you on. And you remember you early on got the advice about St. Francis? Yes. Well, there's talk about surrender yes. and losing everything. Yes. I mean, really, a person making this journey has to be willing to say, I, everything can be gone to follow you, Christ. Yeah. We have another caller. 
Good evening. What's your name and where are you from? Hello. Hello. What's your Hello, question? Hello, I'm Mary from Massachusetts. Hello, Mary. Hi. I, I am very worried about my son. Just turned 20, and he's going with a girl uh, who belongs to the uh, called First Assembly of God Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, now he was raised Catholic. Mm. She was a former Catholic, mm. but uh, he, he's so interested in her. And she has drawn him into this church with an evangelical counselor who seems to be have a lovely personality, very uh, pro young people. And he's, uh, is this a dangerous thing for him to get into? Uh, uh, could you tell me how I should advise him? Thank you, Mary, for that. It is very common, having been a, myself a youth minister where at least 30% of my youth groups were ex-Catholics. Uh, I've been on the receiving end. Sure, I went to Assembly of God College and of course Assembly of God churches are filled with good people, but many, many of them who have left the Catholic Church. Mary, the first thing I, that I would recommend is um, when somebody calls me down in Florida asking for some help, yeah. my instinct is always to help the person on the phone. In this case, it's Mary. In other words, I would say use this as an opportunity to start learning your own Catholic faith in such a way that you know it so well that you can explain it to a Protestant friend, mm -hmm. in this case your own son as well as this young woman. And so this can be an opportunity mm -hmm. to, they're, they're seeking a deeper walk with Christ. A lot of t people think that you have to leave the Catholic Church to <laughs> do that. I can remember sitting next to Assembly of God minister's wife on an airplane and I she asked my background, I went to gordon Conwell. Yes, I attended Assembly of God uh, College and we knew the professors and I said, no, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, you, you leave the Catholic uh, Church for Assembly of God but not back. But the point is, is to get fervent in your own faith. Yeah. Start opening the scriptures and know what the Catholic Church has to say about those passages. Get some tapes by Scott Hahn. Get some tapes of the resources that Mother Angelica will be holding yeah. up here in her, her book and resource nights and, and get your own faith up to speed and then you'll be in a position uh, to help your son and also pass along books like Surprised by Truth um, mm -hmm. which you and I each contributed to That's chapter right. two. That's I get letters from all around the world of people who are even missionaries, ministers, uh, Protestant lay people who have read that and now want to know more. I might even mention the, the new book called Journeys Home which again has convert stories in it but even has a resource in the back called Pillar of Fire, Pillar of Truth that Catholic Answers put out which is a wonderful little uh, compact uh, presentation of the truths of the Catholic Church specifically for teenagers that might be a help to Mary and her daughter. Maybe another question. Um, uh, how has all this brought you closer to Christ? All this journey? Well, uh, you know, the essence of um, the Protestant faith, I guess you come close to Christ through Scripture. And I had a wonderful walk with Christ as a Protestant yeah, yeah. through Scripture. But I've always, in fact, my wife Karen gave me a Christmas present of uh, the walk on, down the Emmaus Road on uh, Easter Sunday when Christ opens the scriptures. If I said, if there's ever an experience, the world's best Bible study was that walk down the Emmaus Road. And the context, Christ just interpreted the entire Old Testament for them and they mm. kind of missed it, so to speak. And it says they sat down, he took bread, gave thanks, Eucharisto, and broke it. Okay, in other words, Eucharistic symbolism there, and the moment they ate the bread, it says their eyes were opened. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's uh, the balance in, in life with particularly the Blessed Eucharist and the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It's not one or the other, but bringing these two together is the most wonderful thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about an intense, personal relation to Jesus Christ. The most intense personal relationship to Jesus Christ can be found anywhere on earth is in mass because Christ is not only with you, not only you know, upon you, not only a feeling of his presence, he's in you yeah. and nothing, nothing gets better than that. Real quickly, I was thinking in myself in this own journey, it seemed that before I was a Catholic, I, I always interpreted Jesus through Paul more and when I became a Catholic, I was almost able to hear Jesus more clearly. Is that true for you and your own you know what I'm saying? Really hearing the Sermon on the Mount clearer than I ever had before. Well, there's some, uh, there's some verses, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount that the Catholic Church takes extremely That's seriously. Right. The Protestants say, well, this is kind of maybe not so directly. Yeah. Steve, this has been wonderful having with you. You know, I wish we had more time. It's been because, a privilege. Well, the issue that you brought up 
which so changed your life in your ministry and has shaped your life now in your family life ministry, St. Joseph Covenant Keepers, this issue of indissolubility of marriage cements the authority of the Catholic Church. And your presence here has challenged us that every one of us is called to make that stand. And I thank you so much, you know, brother, for being here, thank being you, a part brother. of the show. I know that the, the, the viewers have enjoyed your time. And as I've said, they'll be able to call us to find more questions about you, but they can also call us to find out more about the Family Life and Center. And I hope they uh, support you because well, there's a lot more Protestant ministers that are, need to find their way right. into the church. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for being with us tonight. We'll be back in just a moment as we conclude with some final words for the journey. Thank you. This evening we've been discussing with Stephen Wood an eternal moment in his life when he was challenged to make a very difficult decision, a decision of integrity, in which he had to choose this issue of teaching the truth about the indissolubility of marriage. It's a very important issue. But you know, every one of us has these kinds of eternal moments in our life, I guess you would call those times when we are each called to take a stand. Very often it's on this very issue, whether we're a young person trying to uh, decide a moral issue, whether we'll do something or whether we'll turn away, or maybe we're a parent trying to teach our children about marriage, about dating, or maybe we're a husband or a wife trying to work through the difficulties of a marriage. I just want to remind you of a couple things. First of all, you have a great Savior who loves you, loves you very much, and wants you to always turn to Him. And I want to remind you of this great church that He's given you and me. Not just that we have the right teachings, that's true, but so that together we're a family with the graces of the sacraments. Again, if you have any questions about anything we've talked about tonight, call us at the Journey Home at the phone number and the email you see presented on the screen. We're in this together. Please remember to pray for Mother Angelica and the sisters and the network. They pray for you. It's a great privilege that we're able to have this program and this network to proclaim the gospel around the world. What a blessing that is. You're very much a part of that. Every one of us is on the journey home, and we never make this journey alone. We make it together, walking side by side, following Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining with you. I'll see you next week. God bless. Mm -hmm.